All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We wanted to give everyone just a moment uh, to join us. It is just four o'clock, uh, and we want to thank everyone for coming on. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, welcome to the Head and Neck Cancer, What to Expect, the first year webinar presented by the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance and American Head and Neck Society. I am Nicole Fowler, Assistant Professor, Director of ENT Quality and Patient Safety, Associate Professor um, uh, at the uh, Cleveland University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. I'm the Fellowship Program Director. Uh, I work in head and neck surgical oncology and reconstruction at the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Case Western Reserve University Hospital and Medical School. I would first like to just thank all of our panelists for joining us today to talk about navigating through the first year of head and neck cancer from diagnosis through treatment and into survivorship. So thank you all for being with us today. And I'm really excited about uh, a rousing discussion that I know we're going to be able to have. This is such an important topic. And I know we've got a number of people um, who are going to be with us today. So thank you so much for being with us. I'd like to start by introducing all of our panel members. Um, first, we have an ambassador survivor. Uh, her name is Shante Miller-White. She's a throat cancer survivor. Shante underwent a seven hour surgery in 2019. Her recovery from surgery was slow, but steady. At the time of diagnosis and treatment, Shante was balancing raising her twin daughters who were in high school. An acronym that Shante continues to live by is PUSH. P, patience, U, understanding, S, stability, H, handle your business. This has guided her through her head and neck cancer journey. Our medical expert, Dr. Jeffrey Liu, is an associate professor of otolaryngology head and neck surgery at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. Head and neck oncologic surgery Temple University Hospital and attending faculty at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for being with us today. Our next ambassador survivor is Thad Lurie. And Thad was also diagnosed in 2019 with HPV attributed oropharyngeal cancer. He underwent seven chemotherapy infusions, received 35 radiation treatments. During his treatment, he lost all of his facial hair and the skin on the sides of his neck was severely burned. He also developed mucositis and it was so bad he couldn't even swallow water. Thad stumbled across the finish line of his treatments 50 pounds lighter and was constantly exhausted. His strength and appetite have slowly returned as a father of three, he is now back to working full-time, powerlifting, and enjoying life. Thank you, Thad, for being with us today and sharing your story. What I'd like to make sure everyone from the audience knows is that you are welcome to please ask questions through the chat, um, as well as through the question and answer box uh, available in the webinar. So we have both the chat option as well as the Q&A box. And I would like you to invite you to use both of those different options. So what we're going to start with first is we're going to invite our first ambassador survivor, Shante, to share her story with us. Shante, thank you so much for being willing to share your story. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Shante Miller-White, and I am a going into my fourth year as a head and neck cancer survivor. Um, as it was stated earlier, um, it was a, a hard journey. Um, if you could put up the slides from the post. Um, here you'll see that um, this was 
day two after my surgery, and this was my second surgery. The first surgery, I had my tonsils removed where they had um, discovered the cancer on the back of my throat, on my tongue, and then they wanted to re remove the lymph nodes um, in the side of my neck because they say that, that the cancer would probably travel there secondly. So um, this was day two and three that you see here. Um, it was a very, very hard um, transition, meaning that I started to, I was starting to choke in my sleep. And that was an initial thing that I noticed that was not normal for me. Um, and I continued to do that for about a week. And I happened to be riding down the street in, in this car and I, and I felt this, this uncomfortable feeling in my throat. And I looked into the rear, rear view mirror and I started noticing that my tonsils were extremely large. I instantly made a U-turn because there was an urgent care right there um, where I happened to be on that street. And I turned to the urgent care to go in to ask them to please checking because I felt like I was also losing the uh, being able to to breathe. I'm like, like my airway was being clogged. Um, and they were testing me for everything and, and everything kept coming back as negative. So I, I wasn't understanding. But after about three weeks of me going back and forth to the my regular doctor and them uh, sending me over to an ear, nose, ear, nose and throat uh, specialist, I found they finally took me in and said, OK, we're going to remove your tonsils. After that, they removed my tonsils. And like I said, in this picture that you see over to your um, probably to your your left, my right um, are the pictures from day number three. Um, where you see this feeding tube, this feeding tube, actually, a couple of years after uh, my surgery, it abrupted my sinus passage. And if in the third picture, you'll see where I had to have sinus surgery about a year ago, and I lost my sight in my right eye for about eight weeks. Um, it's been a real journey, but I will say that with the support of my family and the community and prayers, lots of prayers, I was actually, you know, I was able to come back around. And like I said, I'm going to my fourth year of being cancer free. Yes, I had to learn how to suck, swallow and breathe all over again. Yes, I, I, I have a different, uh, different taste buds now. I still have a uh, don't have the, the same taste buds because they did shave partial of the back of my tongue as well. Um, and it's 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 difficult sometimes, but I have to just thank goodness that I'm still here and able to talk and able to, you know, see my family and be with my children and my grandchildren. So, you know, I will say anyone that's out there that may be going through this initially or what have you continue to push patience understanding, stability to handle your business. And what I mean by handling your business is to keep knowing that it's going to, it's going to work out and it's going to be okay at the end. If you can change the slides to um, after. This is me now. Um, and like I stated, you, looking at, at the book, I always say you don't judge a book by its cover because you never know what's, what the story is in the inside. And that's what I say by these pictures right here. These is after uh, the, 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 the three surgeries that I went through. Um, this is me now having written five books after that, continuing to be a motivational speaker, continuing to be a mother, continuing to be a wife, continuing to be a person that takes a big role in, in our community to keep letting people know it's going to be okay. Just keep pushing. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, in this short period of time that I was able to at least share partials of my journey with you to let you know that it was not easy, but it is all worth it because I'm here now to be able to speak and be a part of this head and neck cancer society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being willing to share that part of your journey. It, it was quite a uh, tumultuous journey, quite an up and down, but thank you so much for being willing to share with us. And um, I, I just, I know I won't be able to tell you later. So thank you for being on with us. And, and um, I know it takes a lot of strength uh, for doing that. So thank you so much. I now want to turn the floor over to our medical expert, Dr. Liu who is going to share um, from the medical side uh, what, the, what to expect during that first year. Dr. Liu. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Fowler. If someone could share my slides, please. Wonderful. Uh, we can go back one slide. This is my first slide. Yes, so as I mentioned, I'm a, uh, my name is Dr. Jeffrey Liu. I'm a head and neck cancer surgeon here at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University and also Fox Chase Cancer Center. I'm an associate professor um, uh, of otolaryngology. Next slide, please. 
You know, um, as heard by Ms. Miller-White, and I'm sure we'll hear from Mr. Lurie, uh, head and neck cancer treatment is, is tough. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's small things that we do and sometimes we're just big things we do, we do for head and neck cancer. And so what I wanted to mention is that I think head and neck cancer is very different than so many other cancers that we treat. You know, when you have a cancer in your lung or a cancer in your pancreas or colon, um, it's not something that the whole world can see every day. You know, it's something that you know, or maybe you're, you're in your family knows, excuse me, but you know, it's not something that you can see every day. And that is one of the big differences and challenges of head and neck cancer and fits in with uh, that first year after your treatment. So one of the unique, most unique things about head and neck cancer is it affects everything. It affects your eating, your drinking, your swallowing, your ability to breathe, your ability to talk and articulate speech, um, your ability to hear, um, and it, also the, the way you present yourself to the world, your cosmesis, your face, the way you look. Um, every single one of these pictures here, except for one, um, is actually of, of a patient of mine. And you can see that um, from some of the pictures that, you know, like this woman with the cancer of her ear, this gentleman with a cancer on, her, on his scalp, it's very obvious. You can see from these CAT scans that um, in the top, there's a gentleman with a very large larynx cancer who couldn't breathe. Um, in the bottom, a woman with thyroid cancer who had a lar very large ma uh, mass in her, in her neck. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's very hard for me to go over all the treatment possibilities and all, therefore all the possible side effects. Um, so I thought I'd just sort of first present sort of broad strokes for how head and neck cancer is, is treated and then sort of group together common, um, very common symptoms we see after head and neck cancer treatment so we can all start to appreciate like some of the common elements uh, for this first year after treatment. Um, because truthfully, head and neck cancer is not one cancer. It's a group of a whole bunch of cancers. Um, and it has to do with the anatomy. Um, it is all the cancers you can think of between basically above the collarbone and above the lungs, all the way up to the covering of the brain and not the eye. So not the brain, not the eye, and above the collarbone. And that's a lot. That includes skin cancers and the, on the face and scalp and fat and neck. This includes um, uh, cancers that arise in the skin and the inside of the mouth or throat or voice box, each of which has a slightly different presentation or cancers that arise in your sinuses or inside of your nose. It includes the salivary glands on the side of your face. You have these salivary glands that make saliva. And it, sometimes rarely we get cancers that show up there. It includes thyroid cancers that show up um, in the neck, which is a major part of our, our, um, our specialty and everything in between. So um, as, as everyone can appreciate, your neck is a very busy place, lots of blood vessels and nerves and functional areas like your esophagus and trachea and places where you swallow. And so for all these things, you can imagine that wherever your cancer is located, your symptoms will be related to that location. And every uh, cancer journey is a little bit different, but I think we can all agree that um, one, one or more of these elements are at play whenever your head and neck cancer is, is treated. And so how you get treated will affect what your symptoms are. Um, so in broadly speaking, when we treat head and neck cancer, there's three ways. It's surgery, and that's with or without reconstruction. For example, I could cut off some, the tip of someone's tongue because they have a very small cancer, or we might take off a big piece of someone's face if they, have, if they need their tongue and jaw removed and we need to fix it. So sometimes patients just have the surgery for removal of their cancer. Sometimes they have surgery of the removal of the cancer and fixing the hole that's created afterward. Uh, sometimes we give radiation therapy when appropriate as part of the treatment, either, either as primary treatment or in combination with surgery. And sometimes we give chemotherapy either in combination with the other two. Uh, the bottom line is your treatment can have one or more of these elements and you can and sometimes these elements are given simultaneously like chemo and radiation is a very common combination for some cancers or sometimes it can be sequential so you have surgery first um, a reconstruction at the same time recover from the surgery and then weeks later start radiation and chemotherapy some patients get all three. So you can imagine, depending on the sequencing and the, the uh, scope of your cancer, the side effects from this can be quite um, significant and treatment can be quite lengthy. And so um, next slide, please. And so the side effects all revolve around how one is, what, one, what, what one's cancer is, what it affects, and therefore what one's recovery is. And probably one of the most common symptoms that uh, almost all of my head and cancer patients appreciate uh, feeling and, and experiencing, except for those say like on the skin of your top of your head, is difficulty with eating and swallowing. So speech and swallow are frequently affected by treatment, whether you have surgery and radiation um, or radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, many of my patients after treatment need to be on a modified diet for uh, either temporarily or permanently because of their ability to swallow is affected 
affected by treatment. Some of our patients are so affected by their treatment that they need a permanent gastrostomy tube, which is a tube in the stomach, to help them get the nutrition they need. And some of those patients are able to eat with their tube, and some of those patients are not able to eat ever again and are completely dependent on their tube. In addition, um, many of our patients sometimes end up with a tracheostomy to bypass the problems in, in the head and neck so they can breathe safely. But when that happens, that affects their ability to swallow as well. Um, for many of our cancers, especially in the mouth, uh, there are challenges with communication that um, yes, maybe they can make speech, but you know, if you have part of your tongue removed, this will affect your ability to articulate speech clearly. Um, and all the way up to, to areas, if you have thyroid cancer, but they have to remove um, one of the nerves that goes to the voice box or the nerves of the voice box gets damaged, that affects your voice. All the way to patients who have their voice box removed completely for cancer, which you can imagine, there's a lot of challenges in, in rehabilitating the ability to communicate. Um, there are challenges to eating and swallowing, and I mentioned the modified diets, and all these eating and swallowing aspects are very closely related to socialization. Um, everyone on the call knows the things they like to do when they're not at work, or when they spend time with family, and food is such a part of how we spend time with family, friends, and our, our, our society, and you can imagine if you can't eat just regular food, if you can't even swallow, or if you have a tracheostomy, all of these aspects really influence and affect your, your ability to socialize and sort of get back to your life. Next slide, please. And so another major effect is cosmesis, just the way you look and the way you present yourself to the world. Um, I thought Miss um, Miss Miller White was very showed how you know how much she had gone through with her journey and then able to make that recovery. You know the problem with head neck cancers is, is, is to some degree they can be visible to everyone every day. Um, with surgery, there can be cancers that are on the skin and that skin gets removed. So you have a scar, you have bumps in the neck sometimes from your cancer until they're treated. Uh, and like I mentioned, some patients have tracheostomies, which are visible to the world at large. As part of treatment, you might get radiation and that radiation uh, can cause some significant burns and changes to the skin that could be temporary or permanent. Um, I'm a clean shaven individual, but for men and, and, and women, especially some of the radiation may cause hair loss, which can ha have an unusual look if it, if it grows in funny. Um, there's significant weight loss associated with the um, with some of these with some of our treatments because they have trouble eating and swallowing and so patients we can lose weight it's not uncommon to lose 10 20 30 even 50 pounds during treatment and so people look different after that much weight loss and again all this limits the socialization if you don't feel good it's going to be very hard for you to get out there and interact with the world at large next slide please and boy, is treatment tiring. Whether you have a small surgery and you, you go home the next day or same day versus a long surgery with an inpatient course, or you have non-surgical management, but it's five days a week for six weeks, you know, treatment can be exhausting. Some of our patients are quote unquote in treatment for three or more months before they can finally say, I'm done with treatment for now. That's a, that's a long period of time. It's exhausting on yourself. It's exhausting for family. It's exhausting for everybody because it's just a long journey. Um, when you have radiation, uh, depending on your, um, depending on the uh, prescribed dose, it may be, you know, five days a week for six to seven weeks, and that's exhausting. Going to the hospital every single day and planning your life around it. And I just want to make a, a side comment: some of the exhaustion that some of my survivors appreciate in the first year is from hypothyroidism. That when patients receive radiation, sometimes their thyroids don't work as well afterward due to scarring. And you know it's important to recognize that there are medical causes for fatigue beyond just the fact that it's kind of tiring to go through um, cancer care. And so, um, as you can imagine, this fatigue limits your ability to return back to work and return back to the life that you wanted to regain after your cancer treatment. Um, and it's a very big problem. Next slide, please. Um, and you know, just to sort of um, 360, some of the other common side effects we see. You know, mentally, many of my patients, especially in the first year, have a lot of challenges with coping. You know, they steal themselves for the treatment. They get through whatever it takes to get through the treatment, whether it's, you know, just one surgery or like two to three months of radiation and chemotherapy and surgery or whatever it takes. They finally start to feel back to themselves, you know, maybe around three to, somewhere in the three to six month mark, um, closer to six months, usually depending on the kinds of treatment. And then you're, you're sort of like plagued by these questions in the back of your mind and, and anxiety. Will my cancer return? You know, my eating is still problematic. Will I ever eat normal again? Um, I have a tracheostomy or I have these scars on my neck. How can I ever go outside like this? And so these coping uh, questions, after you've moved through some of these acute, question, uh, uh, acute aspects of care, like recovering from your radiation therapy, recovering from your surgery, these next sort of, um, when you're feeling better, these questions start to pop up and become very apparent in this first year as you learn to sort of 
uh, learn who you are now having come out the other side of your journey and are you gonna be able to live like this and feel good about it going forward? Um, there can be significant challenges with partner intimacy because it's the way you look, the way you feel, the way you eat and the way you socialize. And you know, the goal out there is not just to cure the cancer, it's to cure the cancer and get you back to the things that you love to do before you had cancer as much as we can. And so how hard would it be with some of these um, you know, bigger treatments to resume work, resume family interactions, resume the activities, you know, whether you like to bike or run or be outside or walk or your dog or whatever it is that you love to do, how hard is it to resume those things after you've had such a major um, you know, hit from uh, the cancer uh, treatment and journey. So these are all some of the things that we think about when we, um, when I think about the first year in practice, uh, first year after your um, your cancer treatment um, in head and neck. There's it, depending on what kind of cancer you have and where kinds of treatments you have. Any, all of these, and other things are all at play. Next slide, please. So you know that's so. What should you do? I know we have many cancer survivors here and also in the in the group. Um, here's just some considerations for you to think about for what you should do in your first year. Uh, first, talk to your doctor about symptoms, um, whoever, whether that's your radiation oncologist, your surgeon, or your medical oncologist. Um, it's not just about curing your cancer, it's about addressing the symptoms that you have. And we have ways to help mitigate those symptoms and help you get better. Uh, for those of you with difficulty with swallowing and speech, get to know your speech therapist. I work with really excellent speech therapists. Um, and they really, you know, help my, you know, I'm working the problem of trying to make sure my pa patients survive their cancer. My speech therapists have a, a laser focused goal in getting our patients back to eating, drinking, and swallowing to the best ability possible. Lymphedema is a real thing for those who have experienced it, who have radiation therapy and your neck gets all swollen and it doesn't seem to drain and you kind of feel like it's tight all the time. The therapy can be extremely effective. Um, and so, you know, ask your doctor about it and see if they can make a referral. Um, engage a therapist, you know. The future is uncertain. You know, it's really hard to cope with what might happen in the future when you've gone through something so great. You know, the cancers sometimes do come back. That's what happens. So getting yourself into a headspace where you can really manipulate and cope with these challenges and the anxiety and the moving through this process is extremely helpful. Join a support group. Your journey is not alone. You know, everyone's journey is unique, but it's certainly not alone. There are cancer, head and neck cancer survivor groups all over. Who have, there are people who have gone through what you've gone through. They're just excellent in, you know, working together to help each other find ways to cope and, you know, get your life back. Um, be a part of the cancer survivor community. As you can see here, there's um, the Head and neck Cancer Alliance is, um, you know, heavily driven by our um, wonderful survivors. And so there's a, an online community support support group that can you know, help you. There are ways that there are peer-to-peer -peer support mentors that can help you. There's the website here for the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance. Find ways to um, find others who can help you, um, meet peers, and also help another person. Sometimes you find a real new renewed purpose in life when you've survived the journey and you're ready to give a helping hand to the next cancer patient who's really in that dark place. Next slide, please. So I wanted to point out that you know there are some really wonderful communities out there that the cancer survivorship and community is a very rich one. You know, there's the American Cancer Society. I'm putting here uh, the American Head and Neck Society, which is a part of that I work with for the surgeons in the uh, head and neck cancer space. Actually, I take that back. It's all uh, doctors who take care of head and neck cancer. That is, but it's a lot mostly surgeons. Prostate Cancer Foundation, Breast Cancer Research Foundation are some of the largest organizations out there. Um, and I'm putting it here for. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I like to run. That's one of the things I like to do. Um, and every year, except for like COVID, um, I've essentially run the Philadelphia Half Marathon, which is sponsored by the American Association for Cancer Research. It's one of the things I try to do to help me keep my headspace clear and centered when I take care of um, the patients that I take care of. Uh, next slide, which should be my last slide. And just to give leave you all with an inspiring um, uh, you know, image. Uh, this is Carlos Rivera. Nothing I'm saying is something that he wouldn't let me share because this was, it was like a new segment on us uh, previously. He's a head and neck cancer survivor of a very rare head and neck cancer. Before uh, we had met, he was an avid runner who ran the Broad Street Run, which is a 10 mile run that's really popular here in Philadelphia. Um, after he had his treatment, he couldn't run for two years, but he just kept pushing at it. And now every year, actually our Broad Street Run is on April 30th. He already texted me to see if I'll be there. And every year we take a picture together at the Broad Street Run, which is in May. Um, and then th this is actually at the Philadelphia Half Marathon, which is in November, where he ran the 8K and I ran the Half Marathon. So we always make sure we get a picture together every time we see each other. And these are the things that sort of, you know, keep us going, both of us, actually, uh, for, for him and for myself to keep on taking care of. Uh, cancer and taking care of ourselves. 
I think that's my last slide. So I wanted to thank everybody. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Fowler. Wonderful, great job. Um, well, thank you so much. That was very comprehensive. And as you can see, there's a lot that um, goes into that first year. Uh, this allows us another opportunity to talk to somebody who's been through that first year. So I'd like to again, welcome one of our ambassador survivors. Um, Thad, this is, uh, thank you so much for again, being with us today. So uh, Mr. Thad Lurie, please, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Please provide us with your experience. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. And thank you to everyone that's joined. We've been participating in the chat. It's great to see so many survivors and also so many healthcare practitioners, um, oncologists and nurses and people who help people who are in a situation like the one um, that I was in. So I was diagnosed in April of 2019. Um, my diagnosis date was April 16th, the day after tax day, so just almost exactly four years ago. And, you know, I felt a lump on the side of my neck. Um, I had a larger mass here that I thought was a swollen tonsil um, from a previous uh, illness. And, you know, I went through pathology diagnosis, you know, the, the biopsy and all that, and then started into treatment. So I went through, um, as mentioned at the top of the, the program, um, seven weeks of radiation and seven weeks of chemo. Uh, we had to cut the last chemo dose in half because the tinnitus was getting so bad. Um, they were concerned about permanent damage to my hearing. Um, and yeah, I really did stumble across the finish line. I lost 50 pounds. Uh, I didn't have any hair left. Um, it was brutal. And I think what Dr. Liu said is, is very apt. The head and neck treatment protocol is, in my understanding, extremely aggressive. Um, to get rid of it quickly. Mine happened to be HPV mediated, so just radio and chemotherapy. Um, I didn't have any surgery, but it's it's hard um, because it damages your feeding systems and it damages your, your other systems um, that are useful in everyday life. So I'm not going to talk as much about treatment. I think we've covered that quite a bit. What I am going to share um, just for patients and also for providers who may be um, helping people with head and neck cancer are some of the things that helped me, little things, uh, but sometimes it's the little things that become the big things. Um, the first is that if you're recommending Aquaphor for the skin burns, um, it gets everywhere. It's oil-based, so definitely sleep on a towel uh, if you're using Aquaphor. If you don't like Aquaphor, I actually used a lotion that was a CBD calendula lotion um, with very, very good results and very little scarring. Um, so that's something that you might recommend um, to your patients since CBD is uh, available pretty much everywhere now. Um, second piece is to make sure that you're really, really, I mean, I know it's self-care seems kind of counterintuitive while you're going through treatment, but it, mental, spiritual, and physical, you really, really need to take care of yourself, your community, your family, they're there to support you. People like me who are independent and professional and I do the thing. Um, and I was not great at accepting help. This taught me very, very quickly that I needed to accept help. Um, you don't have to do this on your own in most cases. And it's really, really easy to turn to people because when, when your diagnosis becomes public, however you choose to share it, people want to help you. And so accepting that help and letting them help you is actually the thing you can do for them. Because if you say, no, no, I don't need help. I'm going to do it on my own. People want to help you. Let them do that because you're going to thank yourself later. The treatment is exhausting. And it's hard. Your body takes a lot of damage. It's hard to heal. Um, you're wiped out the whole time. And so getting help for your from your community, for yourself and your family, very, very important. Um, when they tell you to start your, if you're you know doing any kind of radiation into your, your mouth and neck, they're going to give you these special mouthwashes. Um, if they tell you to do that up front, do it up front. Do it as a preventative measure before you start treatment. Uh, because once you're, you're actually taking damage from the radiation without seeing or feeling it, and by the time you can see and feel it, yeah, it helps to do it, but it helps more if you do it earlier. So definitely listen to your care team, and when they tell you to do something early, do it early. Um, if you're having issues with nausea from the chemo, uh, peppermint is helpful. Ginger is even better if you can stomach it. Unfortunately, ginger is spicy in the mouth, so if you're going through radiation, that's probably not going to be the best fit. Um, but even just smelling peppermint can sometimes really help with nausea. Um, protein drinks are going to be your best friend. I think I saw someone in chat mention that they're a caretaker. Um, and talking about caretaking is also a big deal because you're going to be taking care of someone that basically can't eat. 
Um, I managed to avoid the feeding tube. That was my number one goal in treatment, aside from survival, was to not get a feeding tube punched into my stomach. Um, it was incredibly painful. I can recommend also some off-brand pharmacies, like not a CVS, but a locally owned pharmacy will make a lidocaine lollipop. Um, and you can take those, you don't have any saliva, right? So you can get it wet under the faucet and then stick it back in your throat and actually rub it on the sores, which hurts like crazy, but then it numbs them. And you have that 15 or 20 minutes where you can push down a protein shake. If you're vegan, a really good brand of protein shake is Owen, O-W-Y-N. I'm typing it in the chat right now. Uh, it stands for only what you need. Those are vegan protein shakes with non-allergens. Um, you can get a 300 calorie shake with 25 grams of protein. If you can get that down, that really, really helps. Uh, bah, 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 bah. If you can get a meal train for your family and have people make stuff that's already frozen, you won't be able to eat it, but that means that your family won't have to cook or find food for themselves, and they'll also be able to support you. Um, so that's really helpful. I see people posting some alternative um, lidocaine. There's tetracaine. That's right. Um, also, other types of uh, drinks that you can find. You're going to need to find calories. As I mentioned, I'm generally heavier because I'm a power lifter. I started treatment at 227 is the heaviest I'd ever been. Um, before you start treatment, eat as much as you possibly can. I promise you, you will lose all the weight that you gain and you're going to need it. Um, I was down to like 178 uh, by the time I came through treatment um, and it was it was hard. So that's kind of, I'll try and keep things short. I, I know we want to go to Q&A and I've got other tips that I'm, I'm happy to share, um, but I want to make sure people have a chance to ask questions of our medical expert and, and, and others. Um, and so I'm going to pause there and I'm just going to finish by thanking the panelists that I'm um, participating with and also um, thanking everyone in the community that's that's helping not only to try and treat people who have this, but also the pharma companies and the people that are doing research to try and find things to make this easier, make it better, make it more efficacious. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. I mean, that was why we're doing this. Um, power packed for sure. You're not just a power lifter. You're <laughs> you've got all the tips packed in there. So um, that was absolutely amazing. I thought that was incredible. And and um, no, this is exactly why we're doing this. I thought that was full of tips. Um, I got several from you that I'm going to share with with patients. So. Um, thank you uh, so much. I um, want to thank everyone. Um, I know Shante had to uh, already hop off, so I had thanked her a little earlier, but um, Dr. Liu, I want to uh, thank you for being our medical expert. And um, again, that, that was absolutely terrific. So what we're hoping to do with the second half of this presentation is, is really we're here for everyone who's on the session. And um, we have this time available so we can really answer your questions and hear how things are going. This is what um, an opportunity for those of you who are going through this first year of treatment and uh, what, what are you experiencing um, from someone who uh, has been there and uh, from, from medical experts, what can we help you with um, as you're going through? So uh, use the chat and uh, the Q&A and uh, we'll, we'll, we're here to answer your questions. So I hear, um, Dad, you had already answered this, but you did such a great job answering and I thought it was a great one to start um, with for the whole group. And so uh, Susan had asked, um, this was just so well said. She said she's a seven month uh, post radiation for tongue cancer. This is what I see in clinic all day, every day. She's got significant issues with eating and speaking because if she does that for any length of time, um, she's just so dry. So in medicine, we call that xerostomia. And it's just uh, for her, um, as for so many of you who have gone through this, it's from that salivary gland um, damage. And she writes that she is desperate for any help or advice. So Thad, you had had um, some thoughts and then I'll, I'll um, go to Dr. Liu after, um, but you had some that I hadn't heard before. So Thad, you first, what uh, did you think? Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was typing an answer to the uh, the oh. one of the QA questions. Can you repeat it for me? No. So salivary gland damage that results in dry mouth. Yeah. 
had a couple options that I had not heard before, and I wanted oh, everyone in the, in the QA. To, yeah, um, um, I want everyone to benefit from your um, tips. So I, I can say none of these work particularly well for me, uh, but I know that they do sometimes work for other people. There's a slippery elm lozenge uh, that supposedly stimulates um, saliva production. There are a couple other lozenges you can try. There are xylitol gum and xylitol products, um, including xylitol lozenges that you can try and take at night um, so that your mouth doesn't dry out quite so quickly because I know a lot of people wake up with dry mouth. I'm one of them. Um, and then there's a spray, a xylitol spray called All Day that I tried and you spritz it under your tongue two or three times um, and it supposedly um, increases your saliva production for like 15 or 20 minutes. Again, it's good for meals because I know I run out of saliva if I'm eating solids, usually like halfway through. I just, unless it's really saucy or really wet and fatty, um, I have difficulty eating it uh, for too long. Um, also, uh, I used cinnamon bitters. I would squirt bitters under my tongue and that would actually um, help out a little bit too. I, whether it helps, whether it's, you know, placebo or whether it actually increases saliva production, it doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you can eat uh, with some kind of effectiveness, um, you know, that mastication and chewing is, it's hard for us. So yeah, hope that helps. And if, um, you know, anyone else wants to chime in, please. Dr. Lou, do you have anything addition that, additional that you tell your patients? No, I am. I'm very sad to say. First of all, I'm going to blame my radiation oncologist. But no, but honestly, you know, radiation is sort of a necessary evil. It's very effective um, when applied appropriately, but it's very effective for uh, cancers, especially head and neck cancer. But honestly, the side effects kind of come with it. The the problem is that we can't just zap the cancer cell and not the perfectly healthy saliva cell right next to it. Um, there are some clinical trials out there that are using agents during the course of treatment during the radiation therapy to help to limit uh, the, the at least the short-term effects of the dry mouth that may have longer-term benefit. But usually after the fact, I have very limited options I, that I tell patients that are consistently helpful. Besides, many of my patients come in with a bottle of water just every single visit, and that's just the life that they lead. Um, certain mouthwashes, some patients seem to really like biotin mouthwashes, seem to be very helpful. I haven't found some of the medications that you give that can increase saliva production in general to be that healthy. Uh, sorry, to be that effective. And it's because um, some of these medications, the problem with radiation is it tends to not just destroy um, healthy tissue, but it tends to preferentially destroy some of the saliva cells so that your saliva changes in character, but that's a permanent change. And as a result, I think it's very hard to reverse that or make your, the consistency of your saliva change. It's not that you don't have enough saliva, but also the type of saliva that you're making is different than what it used to be and it, you just can't make it go back. So I wish I had more to offer our patients who have challenges with dry mouth. There were some randomized uh, controlled clinical trials on acupuncture that um, did show good outcomes. So um, consideration for acupuncture is something that I talked to my patients about unfortunately not paid for by um, uh, our insurance. So it's something that patients have to be able to afford. We have a Connor uh, Integrative Medicine um, Center here in Cleveland that does uh, di give discounts for our cancer patients, but um, you know, financially that can be a strain when patients have just had to go through the cost of um, you know, missing work and, and uh, everything to get through treatment already. Um, I do make sure that they're uh, going through um, and using very gentle toothpaste. Uh, I do like the spray bottles so that they're using spray bottles at night. And um, yeah, those are all the same things. We did have a secondary question just asking when salivary glands start to recover. It's a tough one. I mean, it's it's hard to know exactly what time, uh, the time frame that salivary glands start to recover. Um, it's it can be. I I basically tell patients, um, you know, expect it. We know radiation stays in the body for three months after uh, radiation, so you know they'll start to feel better within that three month time frame. But um, I I expect to see recovery over six months, and then it, they continue to see it for the next year or so. Okay, um, fifth, we had some neck uh, questions. So some great questions about the, again, more with radiation, but about the um, neck 
discomfort, fibrosis, um, you know, a lot about that tightness in the neck. And that I read that um, you've been doing such a great responding um, about that. I understand you've had some of that as well with the neck fibrosis, physical therapy. Can you speak on that for a moment? Yeah, that, so one of the really exciting parts about head and neck treatment is that you get kind of a grab bag of permanent and semi-permanent side effects. You don't know what they're going to be. And then I also <laughs> had something, I believe it was called Lemire syndrome, um, oh, which is, yeah, yeah. it's unusual. Yeah. My my oncologist That's said, you, you know, you see someone in my age group with this treatment protocol, specifically on cisplatin, um, that, that show up with it like once every three years. And so every time I would look up, I'd get these electrical charge feelings down my back. And I, I knew it had to be treatment related. And he's like, well, just hang in there for three months. It'll go away. And I'm like, really? And then, yeah, it did. So one of the other ones you get is radiation fibrosis. Um, my left sternomastoid um, mm -hmm. is where I got it. My, I, was, I got more radiation on the left than the right. I was bilateral, but the primary tumor was on the left. And so I started noticing that the left side of my neck down into my trapezius would just start cramping. For no reason and at first i thought like oh my neck's just really tight like i need to stretch more and then it started happening when i was just laying down or just sitting still like it wasn't a specific motion that was doing it um and so i actually my father is um a radiation oncologist and he focuses on he's the head of um oral maxillofacial radiology at university of connecticut so I have a really, really great built-in resource when I have questions like this. And I asked him, like, what's going on? And he's like, yeah, you have radiation fibrosis. And it, he told me it was essentially premature aging of the tissues and that there's not a ton you can do about it. Now, either of the doctors, if you've got something that he doesn't know, I'd be thrilled to hear it. Um, because the hard part for me is actually driving. Um, when I look left, if I hold my neck in this position for more than eight or 10 seconds, it will lock up. And it's quite, it's quite violent and rather painful. Um, it happens in the shower sometimes. It's just, it happens at weird times, but looking left for too long is really, really hard. So I have to make sure when I'm in meetings, everyone's to my right. Like I, I, I just can't really look left a whole lot anymore. Um, if you've got any, you know, newer research or newer treatments, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Hmm. Dr. Lou, for you, um, do you do anything if it's one certain spot? Like I have patients who cramp, you know, if they get neck cramps in one certain location, we'll, we'll offer Botox to that um, one location. But is there, is there anything uh, additional, um, you know, physical therapy, Botox, is there anything else? Yeah. I, would, I would just emphasize the exercises that are usually given to you by um... Uh, physical therapy and or your um, speech therapist to tell you about neck motion. Um, radiation fibrosis is sort of a lifelong problem. So you might think your cancer was a year ago, five years, three years ago, five years ago. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm in the clear. And it's true from a, sometimes, you know, you've moved on and you're in the clear from a cancer standpoint, but your body always was trying to heal that radiation damage. And I have patients who five, seven, eight years out in, uh, in life that start to have more problems with their neck than they did the first couple of years. And so the only thing I can encourage is that um, those neck exercises are certainly a forever thing. Um, if you don't use it, you lose it. And for those who have had radiation, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, premature scarring that happens early. And so the more you can just maintain that, um, it seems to work. I'm going to give one anecdote for one of my patients that had uh, radiation and then kept having these Charlie horse phenomena. And one patient is not an answer, but um, she swears by the CBD oil. She has these CBD gummies that really work for her. And she said it really worked. So I can't say that it's going to work for everybody. Um, and I will also say that sometimes these side effects, it's a little bit of trial and error to see what works out, which is why you can see so many great suggestions in the chat. You know, once we move to the more survivorship space, I think it's, you got to find what works for your own body. And if it works, that's, that's a good thing. I have sort of, you know, not smoking again. Um, for those of you who smoke, I really have, I'm really okay with trying anything that works as long as it doesn't harm yourself and, um, it, and it works for you. There was a, a follow-up question in the chat with someone who had, um, during neck surgery, who had their spinal accessory nerve. That's the 11th cranial nerve that was damaged um, during surgery back in December, um, I believe 2022, um, how long before the nerve can um, regenerate? So 
um, they can't, they still can't lift their arm over their head, uh, even following physical therapy. Um, and so Dr. Lou, do you want to take that first? I'm happy to um, follow up with you on this. Yeah. Um, so the 11th cranial nerve goes to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is that muscle on the side of your neck and your trapezius, which is sort of one of the back muscles and it's involved with shoulder function. Um, it's a nerve that's commonly um, seen in uh, surgeries of the neck because it's, it's prominent and it's important and it sits right next to lymph nodes that matter. So unfortunately, sometimes that nerve gets injured as part of the uh, surgical treatment, whether um, well, because a lot of these cancer lymph nodes can be right around it. If the nerve is, uh, it's not uncommon for that nerve to be sort of stretched or dinged and, um, and so that the recovery can be expected to return. Um, but if the nerve is actually cut, um, the best thing to do is to put the nerve back together and it can make some recovery. There's reasonable data to show that in individuals where that nerve was actually cut but put back together, um, that function can recover, but it's usually months of physical therapy. I think the timeline for some of those nerves to actually start to grow back and reconnect is on the order of like six months plus because of the distance it has to travel. Um, and, and it will probably never recover to the degree that you had before surgery, but with good physical therapy and consistent exercises, you can strengthen many of the accessory muscles. The function can be almost back to normal, um, even with that nerve is cut rather than just stretched. Um, so I would encourage that individual um, to just do the best you can to do those exercises and keep some faith that there will be recovery. But the timeline of recovery we're talking about is months, probably six months or longer to really start to see improvements that you can feel um, good about. Excellent. I thought Shantae um, had such a great phrase when she said suck, swallow, and breathe in terms of having to relearn how to do those basic functions. And I think, you know, when you're considering head and neck cancer, one of um, what's so difficult about it is just as Dr. Liu said, it's in your face, right? I mean, it, it's right here. It's how we interact with the world. And so, um, Thad, any, you know, patients are asking about, um, time frame wise in terms of how long it took you to get back to normal. Um, any tips that you can give them in terms of goals? I think it's obviously really hard, but just um, I don't want anyone to get discouraged. So we don't want we don't, I don't want anyone to say if they're not there. Um, but uh, any idea for people out there? Um, they're just looking for some guidance. Sure, sure. I, I can only speak to my case. Um, I mean, I've talked to a lot of other survivors. I, I serve as an ambassador here. I also work with a DOD program. I work with local resources to try and help folks because they're diagnosed. Um, I think the first thing I would recommend is, is not to use the word normal. Because once you go through this treatment, it's different. Um, it's not better or worse. It's different. Like there's things that you lose and then there's things that you gain. You, you learn a lot about yourself when you go through this and there's opportunities to find silver linings um, and to change the way you think about things and the way you think about life. Um, so that's a plus. The minus is there's a lot of physical damage and, and some of that heals and some of it doesn't. Um, some of it, I, I think of it, you know, I date myself here, but we used to have the cars with the roll down windows, you know, and eventually it would break and it would stop working. And then your car's window just didn't work anymore. That's kind of how it is. Like you just learn to live with some of the stuff that comes through it. Um, I think the things that started to come back, I've seen quite a few chat questions and I've tried to respond to as many as I can. Um, the first thing I was able to eat after treatment was an egg white uh, with a lot of oil on it. And I think that was probably a month after I finished treatment, give or take, then I was able to move into like ice cream and some other things. There's plenty of things I still can't eat. Um, I can't eat ciabatta, I, you know, crackers are really hard. All the really dry stuff um, is hard. Um, someone else asked, uh, when can I get back to lifting? And I answered them. I think I really started to exercise with intention and believe that I could rebuild my body after about six months. Um, and there are still issues. You know, there's still things, the, the broken window handle that, that don't work quite as well as they used to. Um, but that's okay. Again, you, you learn to live with it because I think Shantae put it really well. Like, we'll take whatever comes with the treatment because what the other thing that comes with it is surviving. And obviously everything else gets, gets outweighed by that. Um, Salivary is slow. Taste is what I'm from talking to people is different for everybody. Um, my sour came back 100 percent. 
Uh, I can taste sour like nobody's business. Uh, savory is pretty good. Salty is decent. My sweet is maybe like 30%. Um, so citrus and berries are horrible for me because all I get is the sour. There's no sweetness to balance it. Um, so there's just a lot of things I don't eat anymore because uh, they don't taste right. Um, during treatment is obviously much worse, but it gets better as you come back. Um, and what I can tell you is that your brain covers for you and you don't even realize it later until you pick up something and you don't look at it. And so you expect it to be one thing and it it's not that you, you're like, oh, I thought this was going to be chocolate and it's strawberry. You're like, I thought it was going to be chocolate and it's not. And then you realize you can't really taste it at all. And then you look at it and you go, oh, it's strawberry. And you drink it and it's strawberry because your brain covers for you. So it's, it's great. Eating old stuff that my brain knows what it's supposed to taste like is one thing. Eating new things that my brain doesn't know, it's hard because I don't get a lot. Um, so I think a lot of my taste actually comes from my brain, but that's okay. Cause I can eat stuff that I know and I can eat it, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So, um, trying to think of other things that came with recovery, there's saliva. I mean, you got to get your dentition checked. I go to the dentist, you know, every three months, make sure your dentist is aware of, you know, the radiation, the jawbone, teeth, salivary issues, stuff like that. Um, trying to think of what other maintenance you can do in that first year. Uh, if you have lymphedema, somebody mentioned that there are those massage techniques and also the machines that will help. I had lymphedema in my neck. It was all like swollen and puffy. Um, but that eventually for me went away again, for some other people, it doesn't, and they just have bouts of it or it's permanent. I, so everybody gets kind of a different situation. Um, and I think what's really important is to remember that you can, there, there's people to help you. There's services to help you. There are products to help you. And yeah, it is demoralizing, especially during treatment. It's really, really hard. Um, and then the week after treatment is actually worse <laughs> because all the radiation is cumulative. And I hope everybody knows that. And then it slowly starts to get better. And then you have the day that you realize that you didn't think about it that day. And then you have the day that you realize that you ate something without wondering if you're going to be able to eat it. And sometimes, you know, you realize that that actually happened a week or two ago because life goes on and you progress. And that's why I don't want to use the word normal. I just, you still have a life. It might be different, um, but it's also the life that you have. And in many ways, I think survivors realize we've been granted something very special and it makes that life just that much, that much more poignant for you. So I hope that helped. Absolutely. Um, I like the new normal concept. Uh, I thought that was um, a great way to put it. And I encourage my patients, if they've never had tofu, try tofu, right? I mean, it's the things that I said, don't ever try that favorite meal for a long, 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 long time, because you'll be so mad that it doesn't taste the way you want it to taste. <laughs> so you'll be disappointed. I, I have to pop in really quickly. Someone just posted yeah. in the chat, um, can't do spicy anymore and red wine tastes like gas. Um, I have the same thing. Red wine actually um, burns my esophagus now. I don't drink it at all. It's very uncomfortable for me. Um, I have a friend who went through nasopharyngeal treatment. He can't drink any carbonation. It's very painful for him. Um, my spicy wasn't great at the beginning. It's gotten a little bit better. I can handle a little bit of heat, but not nearly what I could before. And it's more of a, it's, it's just much more painful to me. So I hope that helps too. Steve, you can eat oatmeal. Oh my God. It's like glue for me. <laughs> I wish I could eat oatmeal. Um, another point that was brought up that I just want to touch on a uh, couple of patients talking about pills changing. So blood pressure dropping, diabetes pills. Um, certainly that's something I, I'm sure Dr. Liu can mention that, that he sees with his patients. Um, a lot of patients lose so much weight. They come off diabetes meds, blood pressure meds. So definitely make sure that you're working not just with your radiation, um, medical oncologist and surgical oncologist, but that you're working with your primary care doctor as you go through treatments because your dosages of certain medications may change and you may not go back on those same um, medications. So there's a patient who says, you know, they're still not back on their blood pressure medication. You may not need to go back on blood pressure medicine, uh, diabetes medicine, any of these medicines, um, because of the fact that your weight and all of these different changes have happened. The other question that was brought up was about um, your carotid arteries. So Dr. Liu, is there, um, are you guys screening the carotid arteries with ultrasound? 
Yeah, I had answered the question in chat, but I'm happy to elaborate a little oh, bit. Um, yes. No, no, it's okay. The, um, re, we know that radiation increases the risk of atherosclerosis. That's the sort of plaques and hardening of the arteries just because the way the radiation damage does and creates scarring, it can have, um, generate scarring inside blood vessels. Um, all radiation oncologists do try to limit the dosing to uh, those the carotid arteries as part of their plan. Um, that being said, sometimes the tumors are close by and they thought that's what you got to do. Um, but the development of the atherosclerosis, especially if it becomes clinically evident, is usually not in the early phase or in that first year, but usually four, five, eight, 10, 20 years out. So at least in our group, we are, and it doesn't happen to everybody. It just happens, you know, it happens. It just doesn't happen to everybody. So it's not a circumstance where we're doing a routine surveillance for, for anybody. Um, However, if there's any patient, if they get a CAT scan for, um, as, you know, as part of their um, routine checkup or they get a CAT scan for another reason or they, or they see something that suggests that there might be um, arterial plaques, we do get an ultrasound to evaluate if that's something that needs to be uh, taken care of and managed um, or certainly if they develop any symptoms. So we don't routinely check for it in the survivorship space because it can usually it's many years out from treatment, but it's certainly something that we have seen and do keep an, do take note of if it develops. And then um, we had a question uh, just about that if you had, um, if there was anything you would want to learn or if you, if there was one thing you could go back and have, have kind of set up for yourself when you were first starting out, is there was anything you would, would want to tell yourself when you were first going through this? Anything we haven't covered? I don't know. My wife has actually joined me. She was my caretaker. Um, and she always volunteers if there are other caretakers that want to talk, because um, caretaking is a real thing. Is If there's anything I could tell myself now at the beginning of treatment, what would it be? Don't be cavalier. Hmm. Don't be cavalier. Yeah. Be okay accepting help. It's huge. And I, I not to be sexist, but especially for men. Right. We were taught from an early age that you got to do it yourself. You got to be strong, got to man up and all that crap. And the truth of the matter is you need help and that's OK. And it's going to go better if you accept that help. So do it and then thank the people that help you. And everybody gets something out of that. Yeah, I wanted to uh, follow up from that. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I have all kinds of patients I take care of as part of my practice, and it is always the most challenging and heartbreaking to see some of the patients in my clinic who don't have anyone to help them through their cancer journey. Um, it is very, very difficult for them to get through it. Um, and by and large, those patients just don't do as well because, you know, they need help. Um, you know, I think it's not to be, um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, this is cancer care. And so these, this is one of the few times when it's okay to, for everyone to, to help you. People get it. People get it when people get sick. People get it when people get cancer. Your job should understand it's time for you to step away for a little bit and take care of yourself because, um, you know, it's a time to set those other priorities aside because, you know, you, you need to take this journey because your life is on the line. And so don't be shy about asking for help. Don't be shy about asking friends and leaning on friends and family because that's what that, that they, that's what we're here for. That's what we're here to do is to help people get through this process because really it is a very difficult journey to do alone. And I'll, I'll add on to that quickly. I mean, that's in many ways what the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance is for. That's why I'm an ambassador. So for the caretakers that are on this call, that have patients who need someone to talk to, please get in touch with Amanda and her staff. And I'm more than happy to talk to folks. When I was diagnosed, someone that I worked with called me an hour after he found out and said, I had the exact same diagnosis and pathology eight years ago, how can I help? And he talked to me for an hour and a half. And I felt so much better knowing someone that had gone through the journey, understanding what was going to happen, seeing it laid out before me. And it really made me feel like I kind of had a grip on it as opposed to like, oh, my God, like there's this thing that I don't know a lot about and it's terrifying and I have no idea what's going on and my life is on the line. It's not a great feeling. So having someone that can stand in and just steady you a little bit and say, I'm going to be here. And when you need to talk to somebody. I understand. I might not be able to help, but at least I can listen. Um, I think that's a really big part of our community. 
Beth, if you have just one more minute, there was um, in our Q&A, there's a patient who, you know, basically mentioned that, that he hasn't seen anything positive come through this cancer diagnosis yet. And, and I'm not quite sure where he or she is on their cancer journey, but where you are now, are you able to, you know, just speak for a moment on the perspective that you've been able to gain now, you know, four years out, um, because you, you did mention now, you know, there, there have been some positive that, that you've seen, you know, it, it changes your life in a, in a way that, that I, I certainly can't speak to, but maybe you could for a moment. I can, and I'll, I'll be very careful to say again, this is my journey and everyone's journey through this is different. Um, and it's hard. It's really, really hard. Um, and it damages you. But you also learn things about yourself. Um, you know, you go through treatment, which is, in my opinion, probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I made it through. And so I know I can do that. I can do hard things. And it also helped me look at the priorities and where I was spending my time in my life and realized that I, I remember when I got the diagnosis, it was actually in an email and I sat there, it was April 16th and my wife and I were crying in my office. And I remember the first thing I thought, and I don't know why this is the first thing I thought was, I hope I can make it to one more Christmas so that I can spend one more Christmas. Cause I have three boys and they were a little younger at the time. And that was kind of like, okay, like I want, I mean, I love my family and I realized I've been traveling a lot for work and I didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted the time with my family. And so the last piece is that it really helps you put things in perspective um, when someone's being petty at work or when someone cuts you off in traffic or on the other side, when someone needs help, you understand that in a different way than you did before. And you react to things differently, sometimes, you know, not better or worse, just differently again. And I think your perspective shifts. I feel that my perspective shift was a good one. Uh, that may not be the case for everyone, but that's what I tried to take away from. Well, I think that is the perfect way to um, wrap up our uh, webinar today. I just want to, again, thank our panelists, um, Chante, uh, our head and neck cancer ambassador. Um, Chante had to step away, but uh, our medical expert, Dr. Liu, um, our head and neck cancer ambassador, Thad, um, for serving on the panel, for providing us with these incredible insights. Um, a special thanks to our Head and Neck uh, Cancer Alliance for having us, the American Head and Neck Society, uh, for their time in organizing and hosting, and the Head and Neck uh, Cancer Center, uh, what to expect the first year webinar. Thank you guys so much for sticking with us, for the being with us for this last hour. And uh, um, being uh, with us, asking all these great questions so we could talk about it. Um, we really appreciate all of your time today. So thank you so much. Thank you.